Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica. I am an ambassador with Sharks for Kids. Sharks for Kids is a nonprofit organization founded seven years ago by Jillian Morris. Jillian is a marine biologist, uh, underwater photographer, videographer, has spent thousands of hours in the water with sharks. So she created this amazing organization to teach others about why sharks are so important and why we need them on our planet. So we're going to dive deep into the world of sharks today. I'm going to show some pictures here and maybe a video of what sharks are really like. As I prepare this, I want you to think about what are the first words that pop into your head when you think of shark? All right, so here's our Sharks for Kids. And we're gonna hop right into a video to see what sharks are really like. Well, this one's coming closer to the camera. Look at those eyes, oh wow. Oh, a little nose boop. Beautiful tiger shark. Oh, and look at that hammerhead, love the hammerheads. Look at those teeth. We're going to talk all about those today and those gills and fins. What a stunning animal. Oh, here we go again. Another nose boop. Yep, look at those spots on its nose. Interesting. Oh, this one has the spots on its nose too. Hmm. <laughs> Another shot of the teeth there but clearly just curious about that camera. All right, so you got to see a little bit about what it's really like to be in the water with sharks. Maybe some of the words you thought of were scary or mean, or maybe you thought amazing, and that's great. So I wanna to start to change fear to facts. A lot of people are scared of sharks, but they don't really need to be. You saw there the sharks were very curious. They wanted to know what was going on. They're kind of like looking at the camera like, what is this thing? And we got to see some of the adaptations on these animals that we're going to talk about today. So adaptations are things that animals have or that they can do to help them get the things they need to survive in their habitat or their home. So we're going to look at a few more pictures here and talk about the life of sharks and why we need them. Oh, there we go. Let's investigate these sharks. Let's dive deep in. What is a shark, first of all? What is a shark? Sharks are a type of fish. They are just a big fish. But they might be a little bit different from other fish that we are used to seeing. They have a few things that are different from other fish. Like... Oh yeah, look at all these beautiful reef fish. So they're a lot different from these fish. And one of the biggest differences, they're skeletons. They have skeletons inside their body just like we do. But some fish, like on the, where it says fish bone there, they have bones, they're bony fish. They have bones just like us. But sharks, their whole skeleton is made out of cartilage. Think about where you have cartilage in your body. our ears, our nose. And if you wiggle your ear and bend it around, you can tell how flexible cartilage is. So they have that flexible cartilage skeleton that makes them pretty different from bony fish, but they're still considered a fish. Now having that flexible skeleton is helpful for swimming. And also their scales are gonna be different. So if you've ever touched a fish before, they can be slimy and wet because of their scales that they have to protect their body. Now the skin of a shark is a little bit different. They do have scale-like things on their bodies, but they are a lot different. They're actually more like our teeth. And we're gonna dive deeper into that in a little while. So this is how different their skin is from other fish. Now, also different from other fish, most bony fish lay eggs. Sharks can lay eggs, but different sharks do different things in order to have their babies. Some of them are born alive like we are. So they have a cord, the umbilical cord that's attached to their babies from their moms. 
And so when they're born, when that cord is unattached, they get a belly button just like we have. So lemon sharks, like at the top there, they have a belly button just like we do because they are born alive. Now others might be hatched out of eggs. Maybe they're hatched out of eggs inside the mom's belly and then they're born or the moms lay their eggs. So this bottom picture with all the little pouches, those are shark eggs. Sometimes they're called mermaid purses and I love that name, but these are shark eggs. Now in each of those pouches is one shark pup. That's a baby shark. You can see in the picture in the corner there, it's a corkscrew shaped egg and then a little Port Jackson shark is popping out of it. So different sharks have different shaped eggs. So you can kind of see what they came from or looking at the egg, you can tell what kind of shark may have laid that egg. So the Port Jackson there is popping out of the egg and sometimes we find the egg cases on the beach. Now they might be empty. That means the baby has wiggled out and left the egg case behind. You may notice it looks like there's little strands coming off the eggs. That kind of helps to hold on to the seaweed or look like seaweed so other animals don't see them and eat them. So sometimes the babies, when they're born, or the pups, they look just like the adults are going to. Other times, the babies might look different from the adults in order to blend in. So the bottom here, we have the zebra shark. Zebra sharks are born with the stripes and then they grow up to have the spots. And sometimes that can get confusing. Are they zebra sharks or are they leopard sharks? Some people call them different things, but they are zebra sharks because they start with those stripes. Now, baby sharks are all on their own as soon as they're born. The moms don't stick around and help them out. So they sometimes need that camouflage to hide out in the mangroves or different areas in the coral reefs so that they don't get eaten by bigger things. So we're, we're talking about what sharks are, but I wanna stop and talk about why are they so important? So we need clean oceans in order to have food, in order to have oxygen, a lot of our oxygen comes from plants in the ocean. And for the ocean to stay healthy, we need sharks. So we actually need sharks. Whether we live by the ocean or not, we're all connected to the ocean by um, breathing air. So why are sharks so important? They are apex predators, a lot of them are. That means they're top of the food chain. So they eat bigger fish to help make sure there's not too many big fish eating all the smaller fish. They help to balance out the ecosystem, the environment where they live. They keep everything under control. Now you might be wondering what keeps the sharks under control. Well, a lot of the sharks, they have to be older than most small fish in order to have babies. And they might not have as many babies as these smaller fish. So they reproduce more slowly and they don't have as many offspring as these fish do. So that's what keeps them from taking over. But they are top of the food chain. It's their job to make sure that there's not too many of one thing taking over the ocean habitat. But even though we need sharks and they are important, we have over a hundred million sharks taken out of the ocean every year. I want you to think about that for a second, 100 million. That's a big number. Why would they need to be taken out of the ocean? You might be thinking about shark finning. That's definitely a problem. And making shark fin soup with that, uh, those fins. But also things that we have here in the United States, supplements, cosmetics, uh, there's used to be shark products in toothpaste, in shampoo. We've used shark products for a lot of things. We've mostly used their oil. They have oily livers that help to keep them buoyant in the water. But we've taken that oil to use it for other things. Now, there are a lot of companies that are moving away from using shark products. Um, but if you see squalene on a label, that is from a shark. So we want to be aware of what we're using and what's in the products that we buy because we don't want to support them, right? We want the sharks to stay in the ocean to keep the ocean healthy. Also things in souvenir shops, uh, they might not have been taken in the proper way. So you want to make sure that you're not um, purchasing those things and making it so other people are going out and getting more.
One of the best things to do is you can go scan the beach for shark teeth in the sand. Usually they're a darker color. That means they're fossilized. It means they fell out of the shark's mouth and they have become fossils. So the shark wasn't hurt to get that tooth. So that is the best kind of shark souvenir you can find. So while they aren't taken out of the ocean, that's where we find these sharks. They're they are found all over the world and they're taken out of every ocean in the world. So sharks are found all over the world, even in some of the colder regions, we find different sharks. They can live in all types of habitats. They might live in the mangroves like this little lemon shark is hiding from bigger animals. They might live on the sandy bottom like the hammerhead looking for its favorite food of stingrays. Or they might be like the nurse shark and hanging out at the coral reefs. They can live in all different habitats. They might just live in the open ocean too, like a great white. I want to talk about the differences in some of these sharks. We have over 450 different kinds of sharks. That's amazing. So they're, they're quite diverse and that's great. You know, sharks look different from each other. People look different from each other. And some people can be tall, some can be short. Sharks can be big, sharks can be small. And actually most sharks are small. Most sharks don't get very big, but the biggest one in the world is the whale shark. Whale sharks are the size of school buses. Pretty amazing. But they are considered to be gentle giants because they eat the tiniest food on the planet, little plankton, little tiny fish, shrimp, eggs, pieces of plants. They have a big wide mouth. And we're gonna see that in just a second to help slurp up the water and eat all the little plankton in the water. So that's the biggest, but I want to show you the smallest. So the biggest is the size of a school bus. The smallest is the size of that finger at the top of the picture there. It's the size of a pencil. That is the velvet belly lantern shark. They are tiny. And then, of course, there's a lot in between their sizes, like the oceanic white tip, who reaches 11 to 13 feet, while the whale shark reaches around 30 feet. So here's that whale shark siphoning up the water and eating the plankton and kind of getting the water back out. So look at that big mouth. They are not harmful at all. They're like I said, they're gentle giants. They are filter feeders, just like the basking shark in the corner here. It's like, looks like it has the mouth the size of a beach ball and it just swims through the water collecting plankton. So the biggest sharks in the world eat the smallest food. And then one of the next biggest is the great white. We always hear about the great white because of TV shows and movies, but the great white is not the largest shark in the world. I live in Maine and I always hear reports of great white sharks off the coast. And really they turn out to be basking sharks, which are just cruising along looking for plankton. They're just big sharks and people assume it must be a great white. And that's not always true. Now I want to show you some of the sharks that I have where I live and you might have where you live too. We have the spiny dogfish, which is about four feet long at the most, three to four feet. So they're not very large sharks, but they are caught in a lot of fishing nets when we go out fishing for different things, which is another problem for sharks too, is being bycatch or caught in fishing nets. And then they get kind of tossed out and they might not survive that traumatic experience. And also there are some restaurants, even here in the state of Maine, where they serve dogfish at the restaurant. And, you know, shark meat isn't the healthiest thing to be eating right now with so much pollution in the water. And we need the sharks to stay in the water. So that's something you can watch for is what's on the menu at places that you're eating at as well, and not supporting places that serve things like sharks when we know where sharks belong in the ocean. We also have the blue shark. I love these. Look at that long pointy nose and the big eyes. They're so goofy. I love them. Now they're called a blue shark because guess what? They're blue. Not all sharks are blue. Most of them are not actually, even though we always see them in cartoons and shows as blue, but this one truly is blue. Then of course the basking shark, as I've been talking about, look at that big nose. You just kind of want to boop that nose there. But they are just swimming around with their mouth open. They do have tiny teeth, but they don't use them. They are the filter feeders as well. We also have the short fin mako, which is amazing because these are the fastest sharks on the planet. They can go about as fast as some cars drive through towns. 
So that's pretty, pretty impressive. And of course they can do it in short bursts. They can't do it for very long or they might get tired. So they can go really fast, the fastest sharks. Then the thresher sharks, these are one of my favorites too. I just love so many of them. Because if you look at this animal, look at that long tail. They use that tail almost like a whip where they will hit the fish and they'll stun the fish. The fish is like, oh, what just happened? And then they can scoop it up and eat it. But we don't normally use the word cute with the sharks. And I think we should, because look at that face. It's so cute. It almost looks like it's worried. It just has such a personality in that face. And then we do have the sand tiger sharks. These are kind of more towards the bottom of the ocean. And they have some pointy teeth to bite through clams and shells and things like that. And then of course we occasionally get the great whites up here. Um, we had one up here this summer. We have some down by Massachusetts that are being studied to learn more about them, which is exciting. So as I mentioned, they're not the biggest sharks. And I really love looking at this picture because you can really see the counter shading on this animal. Counter shading is when the dark or the back is darker and the bottom is lighter. Then they're kind of camouflaged from both directions. If something is underneath it, that white belly is going to blend in with the lighter color sky at the top of the water. And then their dark back will blend in more looking down. So they do have some amazing counter shading. So let's look at some different parts of the sharks and how they work. We've talked a little bit about some of these, but I want to go more in depth with some of these adaptations they have. So I mentioned those Jawsome adaptations. So these are things, remember, that animals can do or that they have to help them survive in their habitats. And some sharks have very similar adaptations to other sharks, and some are pretty unique and special. So let's start with the teeth. I'm sure that's what you are all thinking about when I first said, what, what words pop into your mind when you think of sharks? You might think of shark teeth. So sharks do have multiple rows of teeth, and that's mostly because they don't have strong gums like we do to hold our teeth in, so they can easily lose their tooth, but there's always another one ready to grow in. So they lose a few teeth every couple of weeks, it seems like. They can lose their teeth quite often, but they're always ready with some as backup. Some of these sharks, like the one that you see at the top, can kind of push their jaws out to grab onto their food. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll do a test bite of something. If they're not sure if it's food, they don't have hands like we do to grab and feel. So the way that they feel is with their mouth. So if anyone has ever been bitten by a shark and we hear about shark attacks all the time, but they're not really attacks, they're more like test bites. They're trying to figure out what this thing is. So we might confuse a great white for a seal. We might look like a seal. And when it does a test bite and it realizes we're not a seal, it swims away, but their teeth can cause some damage. But it's pretty rare to be um, hurt by a shark. You can be hurt by cows more likely than you can be hurt by sharks. Uh, but we only hear about it when something bad happens because you're not going to hear in the news like, oh, Jessica went swimming with sharks and she was totally fine. That's not a good news story, right? We want to hear about what happens when something goes wrong. Uh, so most of the time, sharks are not biting people. But they do have different shaped teeth for eating different types of food. And we talked about how they are fish. And just like most other fish, they have gills so that they can breathe. We breathe oxygen from the air with our lungs. They breathe oxygen from the water with their gills. Some sharks have five gills and some might have more than that. So, but usually around five gills to help them breathe. Now, because they're breathing with gills, some of them have to keep moving in order to keep breathing. They can never stop moving. But not all sharks do that. Some sharks can um, rest on the bottom, which brings up this question, do they sleep? Well, if some sharks have to stay moving, they probably don't sleep like we do, but some sharks can rest on the bottom as I started mentioning. So some might do this buccal pumping where they're pumping water through their gills so that they can rest on the bottom just like this. And this is Duncan here. Um, he's our media specialist. He has done a lot of these photos and our videos along with Jillian. 
And they also have different fins for different reasons as well. So they have their pectoral fins on the side to help them kind of steer and move through the water and guide them. Their dorsal fins on their back helps to hold them upright in the water so they're not moving from side to side. Then their tails back here, their tail fins are called caudal fins. Caudal fins help to give them the push through the water that they need. They're kind of like their motor. That's what makes them go. And some of them might have a smaller bottom caudal fin, smaller lobe at the bottom than the top. And that might mean that they live closer to the bottom of the ocean. So they're not dragging their caudal fin on the bottom. The bottom fin is just a little smaller. And then they do have these anal fins down here on their bellies. And you can tell the difference between males and females by looking at these fins. So this one right here is a female because it's missing claspers. But this one is actually has two little claspers right here that is the male. Now let's take a look at their eyes. They do have some pretty good sight. Sight is not their best sense though, but they do have some good sight. And some of them have an extra eyelid, an extra eyelid. Some other animals have that too. Owls, elephants, frogs, alligators, they all have this extra eyelid. But this extra eyelid is called a nictitating membrane. So here on the hammerhead, it's showing you close up. The nictitating membrane is an extra eyelid that goes over their eye that helps to protect their eye as they might be going for food. You saw that in the very first video I showed you of the tiger shark coming closer to the camera. You saw the lid closing. That was the nictitating membrane. And that's a pretty neat feature to have to protect their eyes. They can also smell, you know, they have um, noses just like us. They have nares, but they have a few more than we do. So they have two nares that suck water in and two nares that squirt water out. And that's how they smell. They have to smell what's in the water. And they do have some pretty good smelling ability. They can also, here's their skin. Oh my goodness, their skin is so cool. So I mentioned they're different from other fish scales. They are called dermal denticles. They're more like our teeth. They have a root, they have enamel around them. So a lot of sharks touching them this way, or you know, from head to tail, they feel very smooth like petting a dog from head to tail. But if you pet the opposite way, they would feel really rough like sandpaper because of those dermal denticles. Now, of course, we're not getting in the ocean and petting sharks, right? But some aquariums have little touch tanks where you can touch a shark. So if you've done that before, you know exactly what they feel like. So here's a close-up of some dermal denticles. This is a nurse shark here, and we have a close-up right here, and then an even more close-up of those dermal denticles. They're like little plates on their skin. They're basically like little teeth on their skin. Now, there are some remoras here clinging to the nurse shark. These fish do not hurt the sharks. They're basically going for a free ride, and they're eating little scraps of food that might be dropped by the shark, and maybe cleaning some bits off the shark too. So they don't bother the sharks at all. Now here's a close-up of the nurse shark skin. Look at that. Way different from a regular bony fish. It was dermal denticles. So we've been talking a little bit about shark senses, but I want to talk about some extra special ones that they have that other animals might not. They can feel vibrations with this line down the side of their body, the lateral line. It's almost like a groove in their skin that has some hairs. It's like a little canal filled with fluid and those hairs I mentioned. And they can actually feel vibrations in the water. So they can detect odor plumes to locate their prey or potential mates. They can feel the frequencies of the water with that line down their body, which is amazing. That's so cool that they can do that. So that's an, an extra sense that they have. Now I mentioned in the video, I was like, do you notice those little spots on their noses? Let's talk about those. Those little spots, here's a close up in this magnifying glass. Those are called the ampullae of Lorenzini, the ampullae. So they're just called ampullae. Lorenzini was the scientist that discovered the use of these. So they're named after him, but the ampullae are little pits in their nose that's filled with like a jelly-like substance. 
So here you can see a picture of what's inside those little those little ampullae, the jelly filled substance. And what that does is it actually helps them feel electricity. All animals have electricity around their bodies. We don't notice it unless maybe if you're in a dry climate and you kind of scuffed your socks on the carpet and you touch someone by you and it zaps them a little bit, that's because we have static electricity, electricity around our bodies. Sharks can pick up the electricity of animals in the ocean. So you can't really sneak up on a shark. They can feel vibrations, they can feel electricity, and this helps them define their food. And that's extra important for a hammerhead. The hammerhead has that long hammer-shaped head to be able to have more ampullae so they can feel electricity a little better than others and find those stingrays in the sand. That's pretty amazing. So they're ampullae. So they're really good at hearing something. So they'll hear it first, then they'll be able to smell it, then they'll feel the vibrations, then they'll see it. And then it has to be a lot closer to them to be able to feel the electricity. And then of course it can taste it if it does a test bite. So those are their senses. So their hearing is their best and then their smell. So how do we study sharks? How do we know all this stuff about sharks? Well. We spend time with them. We get in the water and we watch their behaviors. We take videos and photos. We might tag them to study them more. Scientists do a lot of research on these animals to learn more about them. So as I mentioned, lots of people spend time in the ocean with sharks and we don't always hear about it unless something bad happens. But more often than not, nothing bad happens. These animals are just curious. They're just going about their business and just being sharks. And look at all these people videoing and being pretty close to them um, and not being hurt at all. So sharks are not the scary monsters that some shows and movies lead, have led us to believe. They're pretty amazing animals with great abilities and an important role that they play in the ecosystem. So here's some pictures of scientists doing some research. They might take some samples from the animal. They will measure the animal. They will figure out male or female, and they might put a tag on it. There are different types of tags. And this is Jillian right here, if you can see my mouse. She's the one that started Sharks for Kids. Uh, here are some tags. So some of these tags might just be to label the animal. So if they catch it again, they know that they've already looked at this animal. And maybe if they find it the next year, they can measure it again and see how much it has grown and how it's doing. Now, these bigger tags here that look like they were screwed in, they are kind of bolted in. It just feels like the shark is getting an ear pierced through the fin because that is cartilage, just like nose and ears. It doesn't hurt them or harm them, but these tags get a lot of information, these satellite tags, and they're designed to fall off after a little while. So the satellite tags might be able to tell us how fast the animal can go, how deep into the ocean it's going, and the temperature of the ocean, where it is, and the location. If they come up and their fin comes out of the water, that satellite tag will send information to satellites and to computers to let us know where these animals are. And that can be helpful for when there are great white sharks close to the beach down in Massachusetts, close to where I live. They can let people know like, hey, there's been some sharks in the water, so you might not want to go swimming or, you know, just let you know what's going on with those animals. There's also some websites where you can track the sharks and see where they've been, which is really fun. So with all of this, we need your help. You don't have to be a shark scientist, a marine biologist, or underwater photographer. You don't have to be any of those things to help sharks. Sharks help us so much and we don't even realize it most of the time, but they need our help now. So some of the things that you can do, I mentioned making sure you check the, um, the ingredient list on things that you buy. So there's no shark products in there. You can educate other people about sharks and share some of the facts that you've learned today to help others understand and not be so scared of them. You can also donate to shark conservation organizations and you wanna make sure that um, they're doing really good work and that the money is going towards helping the sharks. Um, you can donate to Sharks for Kids to help us do educational programs all over the world. We've reached people all over the world. And that's really important because it's a global effort. We need everyone to help out.
Also something that you can do in your everyday lives is cut back on the amount of single use plastics that you use. So if you use a water bottle that you're just gonna get rid of right after you're done, that's kind of wasteful and it can go into the ocean and pollute the ocean. So having a water bottle that you get to keep and take everywhere with you, a reusable one, is very helpful. That's the same for straws and forks and knives. Instead of using plastic, reuse what you have at home and just wash it. That way we're getting less and less plastic in the ocean because that's a big problem right now. Also, if you're out walking around, if it's safe to do so and you find some litter on the beach or just in a park or on the ground, if you can, pick it up and make sure it gets into the trash. But again, that's only if it's safe to do so. There's so many things that you can do about sharks and you are, or you can do to help sharks. And you're already doing something right now by learning more about them. Because when we understand something, it helps us to um, care about something. And that also helps us to want to care for that animal. So learning is important. So I want to thank you all so much for listening to the Shark Talk today and learning more about sharks. We are on social media if you're interested in looking at more shark information. Also on our website, we have tons of shark activities, coloring pages, fact sheets, different experiments you can do and um, crafts you can create. And there are curriculum pieces on there for teachers that are all free to download. So I definitely encourage you to check out sharksforkids.com. Have one of your grownups help you do that and continue learning about sharks and continuing to spread the word that we need healthy oceans and we can only have that with sharks. So thank you all so much. Have a great day.